and welcome to Malmakes. Today we're doing a painting based on Kirby and the Forgotten Land. This is the full version. If you're interested in the time lapse, you can click on the card here. Otherwise, let's get started. Kirby and the Forgotten Land just came out and I've been adoring it. It's super cute, there's some really unique levels and worlds and settings for a Kirby game, and it's in 3D and everything is adorable because it's Kirby. So I wanted to paint something from that, and I think the first level is probably most unique for a Kirby game, or at least the ones I've played. I think it was really cool to have the destroyed, abandoned city. So I wanted to do something like that, and I never learned how to do three-point perspective in my K-12 education, nor in my college education, so it's something I had to teach myself. And if you've done one and two point or seen my videos that where I've done a one or two point painting, um, this is very similar. So I just have three points instead of one or two. And the rule is if there's a straight line, it's going to a vanishing point. That's just kind of the baseline rule. So I have a point to the left where all of the left sides of everything converge down into that point. I have a right point where all of the right sides of things converge down into a point. And I also have a top vanishing point where all of my verticals converge into that point over there. So everything is going to go to a vanishing point and it makes it a little bit simpler in some ways because it's like, oh, which point is it going to? And you kind of figure it out from there. Um, you can have this um, this version, which is where you're like a worm's eye view or um, like a lizard view or something, where you're down tiny, you're an ant on the ground looking up, and everything seems huge and massive to you. You can also do it in reverse, where you put your vanishing point at the bottom of the frame and move your two side vanishing points up, and that would be like a bird's eye view, where you see the tops of all the buildings and they all reach down into the ground. Um, so I'm gonna flip this drawing I have upside down. And you kind of have to imagine, because I haven't drawn it, where the sky here is actually going to look like the road and everything is going to stretch down onto the tiny street corner that would be way below you. Um, so to give you kind of an idea of what it would look like if I were doing this from the sky, it would kind of look like this. Like if this was a road and this was a road, everything kind of stretches up, way up towards you and down tiny to the road. It's not exact because I didn't draw it to be that way, but that's kind of the look of how it should be, if you can imagine that. Um, but I'm doing it from a worm's eye view because I thought it would be really cool to make this city just seem huge and intimidating because it's a Kirby game and it's not intimidating, it's a Kirby game. So I thought that would be fun. And I'm doing this, like I said, in three-point perspective. I'm bringing some side buildings in to kind of contain the space here because it just looks more overwhelming then. I thought that would be fun. So the first thing I want to do is I want to do a wash over the entire canvas and make this blue, bright sunshine blue. So I have a thalo blue down here. Um, this is thalo blue green shade, I believe. And I'm going to bring that down on the bottom of the canvas and do a gradient into a more um, thalo blue red shade, which is a little bit more of a deep navy blue towards the top. So I just have some sort of gradient back there that will look interesting to look at. Um, and because I'm going to do this as a wash, it's kind of watercolor, I'm going to grab a paper towel and try and tap out some of the paint from the canvas to make just vague impressions of clouds. And later, if I want, I can throw some white paint on top to really push that impression of clouds so it looks like there's some there in the sky. My first color here is Thalo Blue Green Shade, and I've mixed in some glazing liquid, some slow dry medium, and some thinner, and just a touch of water to make it a little bit more liquidy. And it's very transparent as you can see, and I've done one layer about halfway up with this, and now I'm gonna mix more of the Thalo Blue Green Shade into it to make it a little bit darker, blend it to the top third, and then I'll switch to Thalo Blue Red Shade to do the very top. Pull these clouds out, I'm just using a paper towel and doing a little bit of a tapping, a little bit of rubbing onto the wet paint, it has to be wet, and it's just gonna pull a little bit of color off and later if I wanna push the look of the cloud, I can add a little bit of highlight white to it with some solid white paint. So my attempt at trying to do clouds by picking up this paint didn't work super great. It picked up some of the paint and you can see where some of these clouds are, but they're still kind of blue, which is fine for the shadow for them. They should be different than the background sky, 
but there's no shape. There's like there's no detail levels highlights for this. It's just all light blue on a background of a darker blue. So I need to have that definition on the cloud so it looks more like a cloud instead of a mess here on the canvas. This is the ugly part of painting, the ugly stage, where it'll start to get its details and start to look better later. So in order to do that, I'm going to be using zinc white, which is a transparent white, and you can tell because you can see these three black lines right here. Some of the zinc white is painted on top, and you can still see those, which means it's transparent. So I'm using this because it is transparent, and I want to build up just a little bit of highlights on these clouds so there's some detail and they look more like clouds instead of a light blue blob in the sky. And I'm going to use a bristle brush for that to give it a little bit of texture and just building up some of the stuff here on top of each of these clouds. Because the shapes are good, the placement's good, they just need something else to look a little bit more like clouds. I can switch to a titanium white, which is more opaque than the sink, if I need a little bit of a brighter white there on the canvas, but I'm not sure I'm going to need that yet, so I'm starting with this one. The clouds look much nicer now that they have some zinc white paint to bring detail to them, where you can see different layers of them and there's some difference there, it's not just a blob. Now that that's done, I can start to work on the actual city, and I want to draw it in first. So I've put three vanishing points, because this is three point perspective, on my canvas, and I cut them out of tape in circles and put a dot in the middle to be the vanishing point. So all of my lines are going to go to one of these. Now I'm going to draw this in and normally I would use chalk pastel, but chalk pastel is not very exact and this is a very exact technical piece. So I'm going to use pencil, maybe some watercolor pencil, um, to block all of this in. Now it may show up in the final piece and may not totally erase or totally get dissolved into the acrylic paint, and that's okay. Sometimes with watercolor paintings, when you draw them in pencil, the pencil gets permanently put in the piece and it's just part of it. So I'm trying to keep that in mind because it's not how I normally paint, and I'm just going to go with it and see what happens with the pencil. So either it'll show up or not, and I'm just going to have to be okay with it. Rule number one in a three-point perspective drawing is you should have three vanishing points. Now, because I'm doing mine from a worm's eye view instead of like a bird's eye view, um, I'm going based on that type of view for this piece, that point of view instead of the other one. So I have three vanishing points. I have a left and a right, and then I have my third one up top. So the third one up top can move around a little bit. Maybe I could put it here if I wanted. It would change the look of my drawing for sure. But anywhere up top of the piece is going to work. The left and the right one, um, I've put those even, like, height-wise on the canvas, and I've chosen to put them near the bottom because I want to have everything stretch and have all of the space for stuff up in the sky. So once I have those three, I can start to move on to step two. The second rule is anything vertical, anything that goes from the ground straight up in the sky, something man-made, super, super straight, is going to go to the top vanishing point. So all of my buildings, like the parts that are up and down on them, like the left and the right side of windows, the left and the right side of the building itself, anything that's super straight up and down goes to the top vanishing point. That's the first rule. That's the easy one, in my opinion, is drawing everything to this vanishing point. So if I have this tiered building right here, so I have tier one, tier two, and then tier three is tiny up top, 
all of the vertical pieces go to this vanishing point. So the left side of this building, this line goes to the vanishing point. This line goes to the vanishing point. The corner ones here that go up and down all go to this vanishing point. Even the strange buildings that peek in from across the street, their vertical pieces that would go up and down go to this vanishing point. So this is the corner of this building and it goes all the way to the vanishing point. The same with this corner over here, it goes all the way to the vanishing point. Um, even the cylinder that holds up the tower, which is round, but still the edges of that cylinder go up to this vanishing point here. The same with this tree trunk because tree trunks grow basically straight up, those also go to the vanishing point up top. So that's up and down. The third rule is for the left and the right side of your cubes. Everything on the left side of a cube goes to the left vanishing point and everything on the right side goes to the right vanishing point, like if it's sitting on the face of a cube. So this cube right here for this building, the top part goes to the left vanishing point, the bottom part on the left goes to the left vanishing point, and the right, the right top part of this building goes to the right vanishing point, and the right bottom part of the building here also goes to the right vanishing point. That's just blocking in the cubes on my city square here. The buildings that peek in that I have from the opposite sides of the street, like the ones that loom in up here, those ones, their rules change a little bit, but not too much. It's just, um, they flip. So this building, the left side goes to the left vanishing point. On this side, the left side goes to the right vanishing point. So they just flip around. So if I line up my ruler, you can see that where the top part here goes to the right vanishing point and the top part right here goes to the left one. So that's the right side of the building to the left vanishing point. So those ones get a little bit tricky. You can start by just drawing the cityscape itself where the rules don't flip flop on you and then start to add these in if you want because those ones are the tricky ones where things and the rules start to flip and you have to kind of figure out like, if I line up my ruler, does this make sense? Well, it is going to a vanishing point. Yeah, that makes sense and try and draw it. Now, all of the stuff on the buildings, windows, doors, bricks, anything like that, trim work, that's gonna follow the same rules. If it's sitting flush against the side of the building, it's gonna follow whatever rule that building is adhering to. So on my tiered one on the left side, that's gonna follow the same rules. The tops and the bottoms are gonna go to the left vanishing point and the verticals are gonna go to the top one. And the same on the right side of the building. It's going to come down to this and then go up to that. But with all of that done, I can start to draw in the um, the greenery, the moss, and the vines that are going to be on these buildings because I don't want to paint them gray, I want to paint them green. So I'm switching to a green watercolor pencil and I'm going to block in the edges of where all of that is going to go.
So I'm starting with all of the man-made parts of these buildings. Everywhere that's going to be concrete or glass or metal, finishing that first. And I've blocked in windows for a lot of these, um, tiny windows back here, just hints of them so they look like something. And I'm going to start adding in detail for this next, making the inside of these windows look more like glass, adding some different shading, which I've already been doing where I've been darkening the alleyways and underneath where the greenery is going to sit on the buildings, just to give it that shape. Um, so I'm going to keep working on all of that, adding in different grays, adding in different textures and values, and then later I'll go and start to do all of the greenery, all of the moss, all of the tree details, making sure that they look right. Um, that way I don't have to have too many colors on my palette at once. For now it's just kind of blue, gray, white, black to do all of this part, just to vary it up as I'm looking at different buildings, making sure the windows are different on different buildings, adding in details like railings and spires, different things to make these look complete instead of just like gray blocks on the canvas. I'm working on all of the windows and details for these buildings and I had realized that in doing some of this I had some paint on the back of a marker and had left a few little marks here. So I just took some titanium white and brightened up the edges of the clouds all over so it would blend in and not be noticeable. All of the man-made stuff is finally done. I've done little bits of reflections in the windows, highlights, and texture to all of the buildings, and now it's time to work on all of the greenery. I'm going to work on the stuff that sits on the buildings first, um, and a little bit on the grass, and later I'm going to add some like lichen and moss that would sit a little bit on the face of the buildings just to give them a hint of green. But for now I'm working on these big spaces where it's really overgrown and I'm starting with a darker color and a bigger paintbrush. So I'm just taking some Jenkins green and giving it a little bit of shape, a little bit of variation in how it looks. And as I build into brighter and brighter greens, it'll start looking a bit more like the greenery it needs to.
I've been working on a lot of different things, so I'm just going to go over them. First, I finished basically all of the greenery that's growing on the sides of the buildings, and I wrapped it around the buildings just like I did the shadows. So if the face of the building is light, the greenery on that is light too, and then on the shadow side of the building, it's a bit darker. So um, like over here, I used a little bit more yellows and whites in some of the areas, and on the left side, there's a less of that and just more of the regular greens. So I filled in all of that. I made the grass a bit more of a similar color because it should match. Um, I filled in all four of the trees, and then I started to add in flowers. I just took the different colors that the flowers are in game, which is pink, white, uh, yellow, and orange, and I tapped those in in clusters to make these flower clusters here on the sides of the building. I also added in a few um, like pansies, these purple ones that are sitting here, and those are in a few places that I can just kind of add them in wherever I want. Now I wanna add in some vines and some ivy, but I wanna add a little bit of like algae or like moss or like lichen to the sides of the buildings just to make them a little bit green in some areas. So I'm going to take some gray green colors, mix it in with some glazing liquid, and then just brush it in some areas to make some of these buildings look a bit more green because the vines are gonna sit in front of some of those places, so I need to do that first. Um, I also added some symbols to the two signs I have here. I didn't use the same exact stuff from the game and I made some of it up. So there's like a few katakana symbols, a few that are a little bit from the game. Just changing things up a little bit just to make it have some sort of text there in game. Um, so after I finish all of like the green wash kind of stuff I'm going to do on the building, I can do the vines and the ivy and then I have to work on the grass down here. I finished up all of the nature by adding these ivy leaves and vines across all of the buildings. So in some places they're definitely vines and in other places they're just blocks of the ivy leaves. And some of them I have growing up the buildings, some of them I have swooping a little bit, and I'm really happy with how they turned out. And all the shadows, they're a little bit bluer, and then in the sunshine highlight parts, they're a little warmer with some yellow in them. So I tried to do that so you could see a bit more of the lighting in this space. The very last thing I have to do is add some grass down here, and now I have already painted it green. I just want to have some um, so you can see that there's a difference instead of the smooth color gradient, maybe having a little bit come up onto the sidewalk in some places. And we're done! We have the abandoned city from Kirby and the Forgotten Land. If you're interested in this piece, you could buy a poster or a phone case, or bid on this original canvas. There's links down below. Also, consider supporting me on Patreon. You can find out more at supportmal.com. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes of Mal Makes, and I'll see you again here for another video game painting.